here because uh, you knew Aerotech through great parties and you want to be part of the it crowd so I'm thankful that you guys came to participate uh, this has been a very exciting venture for me to work in input devices for 2d graphics partly because I'm very interested in the embedded world but I'm also interested in the graphics world so uh, last summer uh, Eric Battaglio who's our community uh, lead here at Microsoft that uh, he introduced me to Michael McLaughlin who was asked to do the 2D standard since he was involved with DirectX and other uh, aspects of graphics uh, and I had a meeting with him and after that I was like hey is there anything being done about input output devices and he says you're the man you have the job so thank you and uh, it's been very great to work with Michael uh, I've been working on this uh, proposal and so I really hadn't had a chance to par practice this uh, presentation so I apologize if I sound a little discombobulated but I am so uh, but uh, this is a proposal so we would like your comments uh, feedback suggestions questions uh, I very much appreciate that because this is very very important to whoops to this uh, effort well, we all know that C++ was the, one of the original languages that was used for graphics way back then. Because, you know, when the punch cards were out, the only graphics that we had was a light that went on to say, yeah, this uh, bit had been set. Uh, so uh, when C++ came along, it sort of allowed people to build libraries. And from those libraries, they could build more advanced graphics. And as the technology are, is getting better with GPUs and GP CPUs, we're starting to get more into how do we write a, a language that can be cross-platform so that it can work with FPGAs or work with different devices that with different architectures. So this is the reason why there was the push by Herb Sutter to get a standardization of the 2D graphics, which uh, he asked Michael to start working on that. And I know that the title of this particular conversation was 2D graphics, and I could say that it's based on the Cairo library, um, but I don't have so much uh, depth about that because it's still being worked on right now. But I also saw that there was a need to include input from external devices. You know, it's great that we have a great output, but what if we're using the mouse or using our keyboards or using a touch screen? How is that affecting the 2D graphics rendering? So uh, this is why I came along and said, hey, let's go do that. And so in this proposal, I have uh, two efforts in that. One is to create a framework to support external design device support event handling and another one is to support interrupt handling so this proposal is sort of twofold so it can be split into two proposals rather than just be one set proposal however they both are related so we definitely want to uh, include them for the standardization. So what is my motivation? First thing is to provide a process that C++ can be developed to handle input output events similar to other UI based languages. Uh, now that we have C Sharp, Java Spring, all PHP, Ruby on Rails, all these JavaScript, all these languages are very rich in handling UI and UI events that we want to bring this to the C++ world. The second thing is that we, I want to go beyond what they are currently doing and that is to provide a container 
type uh, object that can allow us to easily dynamically add, remove, and validate and step through both asynchronous and synchronous events without writing lengthy code. And the third thing is to construct a framework for present and future development of I.O. devices, its data, and its usage of data. So what is the first goal was to work on the framework to handle input output events. Like I said, other rapid application development languages have strong support and it's and it's so that there's a pattern. If I do X on one platform, it will be X on another platform. So we're trying to make this cross-platform capable and that's why we're doing this standardization. The other thing that is a goal of mine is not only to make this for multitasking OSs like Windows or Linux, but also to be uh, a framework for real-time operating systems. So what is my first goal is flexibility. Not only flexibility in development, but flexibility in operation. So I want the developer to be, have a rich set of tools to develop event handlers, but I also want it to be easy to operate. The second thing is that I want it to be extensible so that it's easy to create new events and interrupt handlers. Right now, and even with this proposal, it's easy to overwrite existing event handlers, and it's easy to chain and sequence events. So what is the scope of this proposal? Again, for input-output events. What is the current practice? Well, Boost has a library called Signals, and it's a very interesting library because it's basically you define a connection like this, and then you add slots like this. So you can put in like 10, 15, 20 things that will fire at one time and give different results. So basically we're using a lot of function pointers or uh, lambda functions to be able to um, put, into, put in a framework for creating events and, cr and sequencing those events. Second thing is that Boost provided a little bit of a library here. Sorry for those who can't see. <laughs> Uh, sort of that would mimic what uh, the ha event handling like the on click event when somebody clicks a button. So here they set the um, connection and add an event handler with the callback to a slot. And then when they click it, it will click, it will hit the on click, and then the on click will go to print the coordinates. So this is what is currently being done. QT uh, is another library that's out there. It uses the observer pattern, where it basically has a collection of events that are registered in a base event. It has a virtual base class and derived classes register that event in the base class. And then a background application notifies that uh, parent event and then it sends out information to the other events to say, okay, time to act. They've also incorporated some of the Boost Signals library to handle events around menu items. Oops. Did I miss something? Oh no. But in my work or in my research, I really came across the library that really works, that's sort of what I mimic this particular proposal around, and that is the jQuery library. The jQuery library allows it to uh, ease to sequence events without object inheritance. It includes animation in the event for speed and easing parameters. 
So what is being proposed for a flexible framework? To allow inheritance? To allow methods to be overwritten in existing events with lambdas or callback functions? Here's an example. Let's say that a mouse event has been created by the library um, developer, but that you want to uh, add a new feature to that particular library. Rather than having to inherit from the mouse event a new mouse event, we can just override the function pointer and from there, whenever the mouse event fires, it will uh, call that new function uh, pointer. Or if we have a lambda function, uh, we can also provide that in as a replacement for um, the, an existing callback function to support both polling or real-time event handling to support animation. Uh, like with the jQuery library, we would add uh, the value for speed, which you can see right here is the second parameter. And then also um, easing, which allows the control to slowly start to render itself. And that would be the third parameter over here. Is that there we go. <laughs> Any questions so far? The second uh, scope is to provide a collection that can sequence events based on a device interrupt. Uh, like I was talking earlier, the current practice is that QT uses the signals library to um, basically allow a person to write a custom event based on a particular uh, signal that is provided by the UI. And this is how they've developed it based on, first they develop a mapping where they map a button to uh, or a particular menu item to a particular uh, method. And then they would do a connect to connect that button to a particular event to the mapping, and then they would slot that in a particular uh, container. The only difference between what I'm, per, I'm suggesting and they are suggesting is that this is one event per, uh, per control, where the, in my uh, quest, I'm looking to see how I can fire a sequence of events based on a particular uh, event or device interrupt. Allegro is also another one that has an event queue. It uses uh, a polling type procedure where you add an event to an event queue and if the event is caught, it will go through the queue and say, oh, yep, I'm the one. I'll do my manipulation of the UI based on um, that event that I've just captured. Now, jQuery, and this is the thing I like, is that they allow you to have a fun create a bunch of events and bind them together. And then when, they f when an event fires, uh, a loop will be created where um, it will go through each iteration and trigger the um, events based on the sequence that it is in the container. Um, the only difference is between what I'm looking for and this is that this is explicitly called and I'm looking for an implicit call. So this is what was being proposed, is that a library could contain multiple containers. So maybe a mouse event can be have a, a couple of different containers based on w different effects that you want to uh, do. Our a mouse event or a key keyboard event can be handled in a, a sequence, like a key down and a key up or something like that, how that would be handled by the event. <laughs> Handling. To allow easy addition, insertion, removal, invalidation, and operation. And the third goal is to add a portable interrupt framework. Now, 
currently the standards library does not have any specification for this and but I wanted to develop a framework for firmware developers to store device data and objects that are easily accessible by event handlers and to encapsulate event handling so that when an interrupt is set that it will trigger these events so the technical specification of the proposal for events we have two base classes and one container uh, one is called event base which would be the base class it's a pure virtual uh, pure abstract um, class that can be inherited and uh, implemented based on each event an event args base which is basically the location of where the device stores its data so that the event can use it and then last an event based container which contains a sequence of events that will fire based on a particular uh, device uh, trigger um, this is the next piece is that we have an interface between the events and the 2d graphics object Whoops. Um, that the 2d graphics object will be called sur is called surface and so therefore we I call the class IO surface which is the combination of the two and then we have a base class for describing the device and interaction with events and that will that base class is called device base so here's the event base class now the reason why we have a inset is a value is that in the container we may want to turn off certain events when the sequence is called or started to be fired and then we have two uh, pointers uh, function pointer holders for um, for the when the event is fired this will this is what the function will point to to be what is going to be causing the effect to the 2d graphics interface or UI then we have two fire methods one will be already having the uh, function pointer in it as a virtual void and then we will have a pure abstract function that will mainly be called by the device base when the when the device is triggered and it triggers the event or the container will will trigger the sequence of events um, then we have our operators for parentheses operators for basically holding either the function pointers or the um, new functionality in C++ 11 the STD uh, function of T or void here and we also have uh, another operators that will contain an event based like I showed earlier the mouse event with the function pointer and the same down here of course events cannot be copied or moved from uh, one event to another because basically an event is an event so a mouse click event shouldn't be inherited by a mouse down or mouse up event um, the, I want to make it so that it's isolated so that I mean yeah you can overwrite the wall you can overwrite the function pointer for it or you can um, inherit a new one but basically moving it would uh, hmm. good question <laughs> um, it may cause some issues with because we're also in, in facing with the low level library to make sure that it's one to one with an interrupt so you understand so we don't want to move a particular event from one event to another event um, because we're trying to make sure that the device mapping won't get messed up Oops. 
Uh, the event args base, this is again the class or uh, base class for the uh, data that will be retrieved from the device and be put into the event as I showed in the previous slide here. Uh, here is as the first argument in the function pointer so that um, so that the device can give some uh, meaning value, meaningful values to the UI. So, whoops. so we would have a, a virtual void set data which would allow the manufacturers to decide where, what they want to do with that data and what kind of variables they want in the uh, derived classes. And also a get data which would allow um, the events to be able to get that particular data that's been in the derived class. Now the third is the event-based container, which is basically, it will store a sequence of events so that when a device triggers that it will actually um, create a sequence, or fire each element defined in the container uh, se sequentially. So here is the basic um, aspect where it will contain a device and a container for the events and then have its constructors and have the method that will be called by the device um, when an event is triggered or a device is triggered. Interrupt is set, basically. Yes? So are you storing the vector of these classes and still have pointers and not for references? I'm storing the... I mean, the vector works by value, right? So you're, aren't you going to slice everything at this point? When you put stuff into that vector? Well, I'm storing the, the events that will be used in that particular container. Well, I would, but I'm doing, um, I, I guess the base class would be like, like the mouse event would be inheriting this base class. So therefore, that's why it's easier to use an interface to get all the different events. I, I think what he's saying that is you're storing the actual <coughs> data rather than a pointer to the data. Okay, so I mean, he's saying it should be angle bracket event based star angle bracket. Okay. Or that's what he's saying. Okay. Or something like that. Yeah. Okay, I see. Or you can have a shirt Okay. Uh, yeah, we're, there's still things to work on in this, so thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Um, so, how do we add a single event to this particular? Um, constructor or this particular object. Uh, first of all, we can do a control.event, the event being like a mouse uh, event or keyboard down or key down event. So this is a placeholder. So is the control because basically we're saying that this control in the IO surface uh, interface between the uh, IO and the uh, 2D graphics will contain uh, a map so that um, we can say that this control will have this event and this is how we add it to the particular container. And we can also do it again with using the uh, C++ 11 uh, Lambda process. How do we add multiple chain events which is uh, something that's very that's something I got from jQuery and that is we can do a bind which is similar to jQuery, where we would add the events sequentially with a dot bind and add another optional dot bind all the way to adding all the events that you wanted to add to that particular container. And the same thing with the uh, ST or C++ 11 standard. 
If we wanted to add an event to the end of the list, we would just use the add method as shown so that this would be at the end of the uh, list rather than inserting it in a particular element, which is the next thing. Uh, where I just had a definition for a new event base, which is basically a a uh, function pointer to the callback method or to a lambda method. And it can be added in a chain just like the bind where we insert with the before event and then add the new event after that. Or we use the index to figure out where we're placing these events. Yes? You said you want this to work for a real time OS as well. Yes. Situation of a real time OS, someone would not necessarily know that he wants to do an add or where it goes into the insert, but want to say this guy has to be done by a point of time relative to the point of time specified by other guys. And but so it's we'll, based on when the when the device triggers, right? Um, no, it's it's based on the importance of handling an event event versus other events as well. And, and so the issue is you could have someone, uh, something where you have five totally unrelated events all happening on a system, each one saying, put me on the end of whatever list I care about, but one of them has a time frame which is much less than the others, and so its position on the list and its time being handled is completely unrelated to the others must be done sooner. Okay. Well, I haven't added priority to, I have not added priority to this particular. Um, Realize that it doesn't say priority that says when, and it's different than priority. It may be a very low event that has to happen by a certain point in time. So when you hit that point in time, you better get it done. But you can do anything you want. Well, that is what the device hand, device base does have a timer uh, hand, input handler for handling those particular um, criteria. So, does it, does it handle the criteria that some guy is really low, but if you've got five guys that have to end by a certain point in time, that they're going to back up as to when they have to finish real Well, then you. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, then you would have like the single event based on the device trigger. This is basically saying if I put a mouse down uh, and then I put a mouse enter, mouse down, hover, and I want to cover those three events in sequence, that's sort of the case that I'm looking at in this particular situation. Now that would be more of a single event to a single device event, uh, trigger, an interrupt. So that is handled also, and I will, I will show that later, but thank you for that input. Uh, let's see, today I was like uh, talking and clicking at the same time, I was having fun. <laughs> so um, to remove an event, we use unbind, both the event or the index of where that event is in the sequence. If we wanted to remove multiple events, we can use wipe, a wipe method, which would remove event, events from the start event defined in this particular sequence. Or to remove certain events throughout the list, we can use the remove method, which we can do like a chain, like the bind and the insert. We can also add asynchronous events uh, using the async method. Same pr principle is we can add them in chain here, or we can do a random, which is great for mess post messaging, um, where events can fire at any time in, in an uh, asynchronous manner. To remove an asynchronous event, we would use a stop event. And to prevent an event from firing, we can use overrule. To filter events, 
we can do something similar to or oring events in the sta and through the container. Um, to remove restrictions, we would basically continue. So we would say continue what was originally defined in the sequence. Or if we wanted to change which event is the start event, we can use start at. For re and also, like I said, we want a dynamic flexibility of how we're going to find events. So maybe we want to reverse the list. So we can do a reverse, or like the start at, we can do a reverse at. So for the start at, is that just changing, like, the point that it starts, and then it'll go back up to the top? Yes. So like I said, this is... Uh, so we needed to get an interface surface between, or interface between the surface and the event handling. So we created a um, intermediate interface object. Whoops, go back. Such as this, called IO surface, which would contain a list of event base event based containers and devices and also map uh, a multi-map device to uh, ba either an event-based or event-based container. And then we would have our particular functions to add a device or event container or an event. So here's what we were I was talking about earlier was the port for the portable interrupt framework is a device base. Um, like I said, there's a handler for the particular event itself and also a timer handler. So let's say that uh, we have a trigger flag that uh, is busy, like you were saying. Um, when the timer would then kick in and tr keep testing to see is it still busy. If it, it, if it is, then it will keep going until it gets to the ready state. And then it will allow the event to fire. It will have a trigger method that will use one of the callbacks in either the events or the container of events the execute or the fire method and also have a location to the event arg space where that device is to write the data. And then some constructors, some copy constructors for when we're adding an event container we want to make sure we point to the particular function that we're going to be using to fire off either the single event or the sequence of events. So here's an example of the events that we plan to handle for this particular um, proposal. And uh, one of them is timer keyboard events like on key up, on key down, and on key press. Uh, mouse events, like I said, on content, on mouse move, hover, things like that. We also want to consider touch for, um, for like phones and other uh, inputs. Yes? Um, we want to keep it simple so that we get at least past the first, uh, <laughs> but yes, we, this, the, that's why I said I wanted to make a framework that would be flexible so that we can eventually cover those particular items. And uh, show and hide and on draw, we also want to cover those kind of events. So what do we have? If we have some future work to consider, like vectors versus, or values versus reference. <laughs> um, one is to complete the interface between the 2D surface object and event 
handling objects. The second is messaging, like synchronous and asynchronous. Uh, we didn't really want to cover that. I mean, we, I put that in the proposal, but that's not the main element of the proposal because we're not really ready to support multi-threading. Um, so we need to consider synchronization, synchronization of events for messaging or even for, um, um, you know, multiple events handling, like multi-touch, things like that. Yes? Right. The other one we might want to consider right now is the special case of the UI thread. Okay. Some operating systems such as Windows and I believe Android comes to mind. You can only do certain things in the UI if you are on the UI thread. Yes. If you're not, life is very bad for you. <laughs> I know, I worked with Silverlight, so. <laughs> Okay. Thanks for the. Uh, we got that on video, so I can keep notes. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> uh, security. Uh, yes, we can override functions, but you know we got to make sure that somebody malicious isn't overriding functions while you're doing operations. Support for more input devices like multi-touch. Uh, we do have a networking TS coming out, but that is important for messaging and things like that, so that needs to be considered. Parallel hardware, um, we need to consider if we have more than one core, who handles the interrupt and who do they communicate with, things like that. Um, simpler coding of events, sequencing, um, we use functions here, but I was very interested in overloading operators because uh, basically, like C sharp, you just use plus equal uh, to add events and minus equal to dereference that event. So that would be nice to uh, add some simpler coding for that. And um, I would like to thank and acknowledge uh, the people that I've been working with, uh, Michael McLaughlin, who again is working on the 2D standard. Uh, Jason Zink, who gave the idea about Boost, and some other libraries out there that sort of uh, con had the principles of containers. And of course, Herb Sutter for uh, like the portable interrupt framework. Uh, he was like, yeah, we should consider that for this proposal or for another proposal. So I'd like to very much thank him. And of course, I would like to acknowledge this person, who's my son, and he's the biggest motivation in my life. And if it wasn't for this guy on the left, we, I wouldn't be here. So thank you very much for uh, coming tonight. And uh, if you have any questions or concerns or suggestions. Uh, yes. The, uh, the discussion before about, about real-time events and real-time operating systems is sort of addressed by the concept that this is a standard for user interface events, not for real-time events such as uh, some, some parameter going over a limit and setting an alarm or things that happen other than the UI. So the, 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 the kinds of, of deadline-based events that you were talking about uh, are not really user interface events, but real-time events that happen, that, that come in from hardware. Well, I think that's why Michael suggested that that would not be part of this particular um, proposal, the device base, was because he was like, we could show it as an implementation, but not as a part of the proposal. So that's why, uh, I mean, Herb said, yes, we want to have the portable interrupt framework. So that may be why we may have to separate it down the road because for those handling those particular events. But yes. The biggest issue I see with this is standards committees do not do frameworks. 
Okay. 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 But I mean, that's why we talk about the events that we're we supporting in this particular library. So, but again, you build a library for a framework and build on top of that. So. Okay. Okay. Yes. Well, that's that's why I said that you have a base class you can inherit that particular type of event that you want to mimic. Now if somebody in the library says I already had, you know, hey it's already there, instead of over having to rewrite another object, you just add a or point to another callback function. So that's that's the purpose of this. Somebody else over here? No. Okay. okay. Um, this is a stylistic issue. Uh, when you look at that are already in the, in the library, such as uh, the uh, algorithms that have that, that spec in which the last one of the arguments is, is a function to be called for each element of the thing. Um, those are not function pointers. Those are function objects. Or a function and a function pointer is it is it or they're, they're, they're it's done by not function pointers but but uh, template types that who's that have a a, a function call operator mm -hmm. at an appropriate time, which means that they can carry data along with it. Okay. A function object can have data. Okay. Um, the and, and for example can be. Uh, They end up calling a function with a lot of arguments in which some of the arguments are fixed. Okay. So it's got defaults or? Uh, but, and so I see in a lot of places here you have function call, function pointers mm -hmm. uh, as arguments, not as in the rest of the standard library, a template based function objects that can be called. Well, we did discuss type erasure, uh, which is basically using templates to. So there's, there's, a style, there's a style inconsistency here, and, and, and there was a pretty good reason for using templates to, to specify these function objects in the rest of the standard library, uh, because it, it's, it's a much more general kind of a thing. You can, you can make a function out of other functions by finding arguments various other kinds of things. And, and you can also use um, uh, lambdas, lambda objects, right there in line. You can't use a lambda for a function pointer. Well, that's what the STD function uh, it's you can put. It's a function object, it's not a function pointer. OK, so well, there is. Lots of function objects in this, in this thing, or function pointers in this thing, that I think to be consistent with the rest of the library, you might consider making them template-based function objects rather than function pointers. Okay. It would make it much more general and, and easier to use, frankly. I think. I haven't thought it all the way through, obviously, but, but that, that's something to consider. Well, I did consider lambdas as put in, in to a particular function, the well, STD. Lambdas, lambdas, you can't put it in the call. You can't put a lambda in the call if the argument in the call is a function Okay. Yeah. Okay. But he is overloading that to take a standard function, and you can you can instantiate a standard function with a lambda. For sure, you can do that. However, though, I'm with you in that instead of taking a standard function and the parameter list, you can just make that a template argument, yeah. and that way you yeah. can do any of those because a standard function has a little bit of extra overhead that you're, you know, that a template. 
template, you know, a function object pass through template may or may not pass. Right. So, so he could, could he's generalized it some, but it could, seems to me like I'm with you that it could be. But in C sharp, we have. Uh, this is another language I work with. You know, when you create an event, it points to a particular function that um, basically does the work. So that's C sharp doesn't have overloading in log functional operators. True. <laughs> <laughs> One of the differences that we might have here though is if you do it your way, and I and I'm not saying I dislike the idea, but every single one of his functions, pointer or lambda or whatever, is inherently different to a large extent every time it's being used. In other words, he's going to do unique code just for this one case of this one event. And I know that's a generalization, right? While if you use both the templated functions, very often that's one function that's exactly the same code everywhere it's used. Yeah. And so, notationally writing it, even though I like your idea, would now get really ugly, I think. But because you would have this. But if you need that kind of flexibility, a function pointer yeah. is a perfectly good function object. Yeah. You, know, you can use function pointers where a function object is expected. You can't use function objects where a function pointer is expected. So, I, I think that the, the useful thing to do is to actually write down a couple of examples yeah. matching what you're wanting to do and try and see what it looks like stylistically if you wanted to make it nice and you might find this is how we can do function pointers or, or, or no this is how we can do templated things here's a suggested way to write it so that it's nice to look at versus you know, because I think you need to answer that question it's because it's going to be different. Right. Every single time. That's true. That's yeah. Because otherwise, you, you end up with the lambda being gay being in the middle of an argument. And if you want to next them, then it becomes even uglier and uglier and uglier. Yeah, well, you can always create a lambda. Yeah. I, I, like I say, I don't disagree. I, I like what you're where you're going. I'm just saying that you need to sit down and write it, figure out a way to write it. Yeah. So that it's readable. Yeah, and obviously I haven't gone through that, so. Neither have I. On the subject, does um, SCP functions have a constructor from a function pointer? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't would there be potential ambiguity here? No. A function pointer is a perfectly good function object. Right, well, if you can construct an SCP function out of a function pointer, and you call one of these with a function pointer, which are. Uh, well, that's a point. We're questioning why he even has a function pointer. Yeah, no, I understand, I understand that. that. Yeah. Well, I'm just saying that you could put a lambda function in as a parameter, um, as a std function, versus a regular function pointer, which points to another function that but is written. If function pointers are convertible as functions, then you don't even need the function pointer. Anymore. Yeah, right. okay. And you have template. Template, you, you can use any of those. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, you know, Appreciate it. Thanks. Well, I, okay. Yeah, go. List all the methods for handling, for removing and inserting and appending events and all that stuff. A lot of those seem to correspond very closely to standard algorithms. Um, and you didn't talk about you have a but you didn't talk about iterators at all. Well, I did. I should have mentioned bidirectional iterators for reversing and random or random iterators for doing randomization of events. So. so my recollection in the standard library is that you define a uh, method in your container and you can do it more efficiently. Um, that way, by the time you do it, you can do it efficiently. That way, but I don't see that that's true in this case because really, you're really you're you're hiding a vector. You're, you're hiding a vector. Why not just have a vector with uh, shared pointers? Well, actually, the uh, I would think about embedded systems. Uh, STL is really not a good practice for that. So um, I was planning to update that 
part before this, but then I said, well, I just got to give the presentation and then we'll work on it for the revision of the proposal before uh, Jacksonville. So yeah, so that's part of the, I was, I was like, I need a container just to show what a container is that has bi-directional and random iterator capability. That's something I, 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 I was trying to show. So yeah. So it would have to be a specialized container of events that would be stored in that particular uh, event-based container object. So, yeah. So it doesn't really have to be a vector. That would be just an example. Right. Right, exactly. But I mean, like I said, STL is not very well supported in, in embedded systems because of the memory constraints and other things. So you would probably have to make a custom container for that particular locate for that particular environment. So go. Mm -hmm. Where uh, constraints really aren't nearly as bad as they used to be. Right, right. And it's not really an embedded system, that's a big box. Oh, no, it's, it's, it's still an embedded it's system. A, it's, it's, it's a big computer in a small box. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm saying is that's what embedded <laughs> systems are becoming. When I do embedded, it's two or three gigs. Not mains or gigs. Right, but those don't have graphical user interface. Actually, well, you can, but they, they tend not to. Yeah. So that, that's the point I'm making, though, is that both cases are valid, and it might be interesting to support both of them in a various, you know, in a flexible manner. You said you do have cases where you still have, you know, the older, more traditional embedded systems that are very resource constrained, mm -hmm. and then you've got the new stuff that, you know, I'm just going to pick on the, you know, high zero, you know, it's all five dollar thing, but really a full SOC with. 512 megs of RAM on the thing. Right. You know, and they get to think for five bucks. <laughs> okay. Um, so I don't have to think about constraints here, but I do over here. Right. And being able to move back and forth and address both of those scenarios, I think, could be helpful. Um, probably just because by the time this comes out, we're still going to have the traditional embedded systems that are memory constrained. But 10 years from now, I'm going to guess we won't. Mm -hmm. And so being able to have the have the standard flow through that transition over the next you know five to ten years. You know. Eighty fifty one is thirty years old. Oh I know. <laughs> but that's but that's what I'm getting at. Being able to support both of those and and you know deal with this migration, um, I think that's probably going to turn out to be important. Yes. You mentioned jQuery and using functions and I'm curious why or to what extent that would play a part there, um, especially the base by phone. Well, because we want to support animations for, you know, uh, let's say that we have a surface that we want to slowly come into play, like with the PowerPoint, you know, you had the animations. So um, that's the whole point of allowing the uh, giving the flexibility to the end user to say, yeah, I want to add some animation effects to to this particular surf 2D object when an event when a device triggers an event. So, okay. I just didn't see how that was necessitated by the base. It seemed like as long as you have events firing, you can. Well, that's why I call it op. It was, op it was an optional. That's why I had a default of zero. So. If you wanted to overwrite that, you can do that. So, well, thank you very much for coming. Um, look forward to the next time. <laughs>